Welcome to Illinois Lawmakers Live coverage of Governor Bruce Renner's budget message to a joint session of the Illinois General Assembly. I'm Jack Titchener, joined in the House Speaker's Gallery by Rich Miller of CapitalFacts.com and Chicago Tonight correspondent Amanda Vinicky. Welcome to the program. Rich, right off the bat, the governor says today's budget is balanced and puts the state on the course to rolling back that income tax that uh, passed over his objections last year. Well, it's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, it's balanced only if, if and only if he can pass some very difficult to pass legislation to enable what he wants to do. Legislation that would allow the state the to get out of hand, making pension recess. payments for local schools uh, and universities, and making the property taxpayers pick those up. That's something that's been talked about for several years. It's not something that uh, is easily accomplished. There are other things too in this budget plan, uh, dealing with state employees' health insurance, again, that he has to pass legislation to accomplish. Amanda, this is a tall order any way you look at it. So it looks like a, a lot of assumptions are baked into this budget proposal, not unlike some of the budget uh, proposals that he's submitted before. Exactly. The governor continually goes back to his playbook because it's clear that these are things he believes the Illinois government needs to do. It gets really to the heart of why we had a years-long historic budget impasse, and that is because Rauner's ideas are at loggerheads with Democrats who control the General Assembly, particularly, of course, going into an election. So that is going to be key, even if some of these things, for example, shifting pension costs from the state onto school districts, that's something that House Speaker Michael Madigan himself has talked about and proposed in years past. That's not to say that it is something that he or the Democrats that um, he uh, that are in the Illinois House with him are going to agree to in an election year. Well, also, they had a huge fight uh, in the like state last year over pension funding for Chicago public schools. And uh, the governor railed against that for months and months and months. Uh, and then he eventually signed a bill in the law that, that gave him a couple of hundred million dollars. This uh, budget proposal takes that money uh, and throws it out the window. So there's some hard-fought victories last year that are going to be rolled back in the coming year if this budget is enacted. We have something a little unusual today in that it used to be a usual thing. The governor and the four leaders actually had a meeting together on the second floor here. After the meeting was over, the Senate President John Cullerton came out and said, well, he had a lot of good talking points, but he's still, uh, this budget is off by about a billion five. Does that match up with what you're hearing? You know, um, it, that is something that we it's had matched up with. We're, the numbers are still pretty raw, still pretty fresh. Again, I mean, to me, of course, yes, you need to look and see when you have a governor that continually promises, continually says, I'm going to present a balanced budget. That's very important. And then any numbers are off. It's fair to hit him over the head with it. But really, what matters is what we have in terms of a budget by the end of May, when the legislature is supposed to be adjourned. Cullerton's talking point there, however, are, of course, crucial when you have a governor that's trying to promise all things to people in terms of, yeah, I'll get more money to schools, while at the same time, I'm going to be lowering that income tax increase. What's notable there to me, really, is that they even had a meeting, less so the numbers, but the last time that the governor and four legislative leaders got together was December of 2016. Right, 14 and they, months and they ago, came, they came over 14 months ago. I will say one one thing, though, that is kind of positive, and I was thinking about this morning, the speaker has had a really tough week. Um, there's allegations from a former campaign employee that, of a cover-up of uh, sexual harassment uh, allegations that she had made, um, and he's had, uh, some people have called for his resignation, uh, others have suggested maybe you should step aside as state party chairman, the governor, his main opponent has said not word one about this all week, and in fact invited him to his office this morning. We'll see what how this plays out, but maybe he's trying to, maybe, I don't know, trying to keep things a little calmed down uh, ahead of this budget address. That's, we haven't really had an opportunity to for. talk to or ask the governor those questions, so it's not as if he's um, bit his tongue in public, but we well, haven't no, had any that, that press releases. Exactly. We could be getting our inboxes full 
of, you know, press releases bludgeoning Mike Madigan, and we haven't yet, anyway. So I don't think, I've never commented on it until just now. I just think, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I give him credit for it, at least that. Maybe it won't happen during the address, I don't know, with Speaker Madigan sitting right behind, standing right behind him. And, of course, uh, Speaker Madigan just announcing that uh, Governor Rauner is indeed uh, starting to enter the uh, House chambers here at the Illinois State Capitol. He should be coming up the stairs uh, shortly. The applause for Governor Bruce Rauner giving his fourth annual budget message to a joint session of the Illinois General Assembly. He's making his way down the center aisle here. Given all that we know about the differences between what's in this budget proposal and what reality may be by the end of May. Is this thing dead on arrival or does it still have some life in it based on some of the optimism that came out of that leaders meeting this morning? Um, you know, I'm not sure I would call it optimism out of the leaders. <laughs> not all of them. It was a short meeting. The optimistic part is that they had it. <laughs> um, optimism, more than anything. optimism on the Republican leader's part. But there we go, on the Republican leader's part. I, I have to keep on coming back to the election. Uh, regardless of what is in this budget plan, Illinois is in a very difficult position from a fiscal standpoint. There's still a un- list of unfinished business from the current fiscal year items that were counted on as savings that never occurred, most notably the selling of the Thompson Center. So without that, it, it, there really are a whole lot of very uh-huh. tough hurdles for this Mr. legislature Governor. and the governor to tackle, and they don't have a good history. This is the second most important budget he's ever introduced. Good the afternoon. first one was his most. President Culleton, Speaker Madigan, Leader Brady, Leader Durkin, Lieutenant Governor Sanguinetti, Attorney General Madigan, Secretary White, Comptroller Mendoza, Treasurer Felix, members of the General Assembly, distinguished guests, and members of the media. Welcome. To the members of our National Guard, our service men and women, our veterans, thank you on behalf of a most grateful state. To our citizens, the taxpayers of Illinois, it is an honor to serve you. Happy Valentine's Day to all. Let's begin today with a moment of silence to honor Chicago Police Commander Paul Bauer. He is a true American hero. He was killed in the line of duty yesterday, protecting the people of Chicago and the state of Illinois. Let us also remember the young victims and survivors of the NIU campus shootings 10 years ago today. Please join with me, remember them in our prayers. Thank you. Two weeks ago, we met in this chamber to discuss the state of our state. I said then, and I repeat today, we are in a state of readiness, ready to leverage Illinois' many natural advantages, our wonderful people, our location, our transportation network, our diverse resources, to become the economic powerhouse of the Midwest. To fulfill that mission is to serve the best interests of everyone in our state. If our economy rises, everyone rises with it. Our businesses grow and create more jobs. 
our family incomes rise. Our young have more opportunities to learn and earn. Our services to our citizens expand. Our taxes can go down. Our quality of life will go up. We can make all this happen. But we must abandon Illinois' fiscal status quo and take steps to make tax spenders more accountable to tax payers. We must enact structural reforms that allow us to be as competitive as we need to be so we can be as compassionate as we want to be. And make no mistake, we are in a competition. And the states around us are winning at our expense. They have out-legislated us, and now they are outgrowing us. Manufacturing jobs, manufacturing jobs, many of which go to union workers, are up 110,000 in Indiana over the last eight years, while manufacturing jobs in Illinois are up only 8,000 in that same time period. Outrageous. We're twice the size of Indiana. And in just the last year alone, just in the past year, private sector union jobs are up 36,000 in Wisconsin. Think about that, 36,000 increase in union jobs. And over in Michigan, union jobs are up 47,000 in just the past year. In Illinois, in the past year, we've lost 9,000 union jobs. Many factory workers in other states are now out earning our brothers and sisters here in Illinois. We can't let this happen to our hardworking families. It is time to get back in the race. Low growth and expensive bureaucracy are devastating to our working families. They reduce Illinoisans' net take-home pay. They rob us of our ability to invest in education, human services, public safety, and infrastructure. They constrain our economic growth, our tax base, and our wage rates. Our fiscal year 19 budget sets out to make the structural reforms that will get us moving in the right direction. It reduces government expense, but not customer service. It shifts responsibility for the cost of services to the people who buy those services. And it recognizes that we will never have balanced budgets if government grows faster than our economy. These are the priorities we've set for the next fiscal year and beyond. They put a stop to the unsustainable growth in our pension and health care costs, halt and reverse the advance in taxes, and restore emphasis on investments in education, human services, public safety, and infrastructure. Our reforms must begin with pensions and employee group health expenses. They now consume more than 25 cents of every dollar the state spends. And they grow faster than you can raise taxes and we can grow the economy. In fiscal year 18, we spent more of our budget in these two categories than we spent on K-12 education. The simple truth is this. We have to change the way we manage pension costs and group health expenses. If we don't, our finances will continue to deteriorate, our economy will remain sluggish, and our tax burdens will stay high and keep rising. Our fiscal year 19 budget addresses this problem head on and creates a surplus that we can use to pay down some of our debt. The key reforms have to do with accountability. We need to move pension costs to people who do the buying and make them responsible for the paying, too. If we do this realignment, we can eliminate the $2 billion deficit in the budget you passed last summer. We can avoid new taxes. We can fund top priorities. 
and we can start the long process of paying down our bill backlog with cash instead of credit. But we should also do something that will really make the economy grow faster, that will really make the Amazons and Apples of the world take notice. We should take the next big step and do what taxpayers have urged us to do for more than a decade, and that is enact comprehensive pension reform and give Illinois taxpayers a $1 billion tax cut. They, they deserve it. The people of Illinois deserve it, and they need it. This is the kind of financial accountability that Illinois taxpayers expect. It is time we lived up to their expectations. When Diana and I moved into the governor's mansion in 2015, we noticed that every light was turned on in the building. I don't know about you, but I was raised that if you left a room on and didn't shut off the lights, if you left a room and you didn't turn them off, you got in trouble. You had to put a nickel in the jar, or maybe worse. This course, when we got there, we, it led us to ask, what was the utility bill for the mansion? It took us two weeks to track down through the bureaucracy who actually got the bill inside the government bureaucracy. And we learned that the utility cost for the Illinois taxpayers for that mansion was $100,000 per year. Hello building that nobody was really living in. Outrageous. We immediately changed the energy practices, put in energy conservation policies, and cut the bill substantially. And my point of this story is this. If you separate the payment from accountability, there's no accountability. People don't question the expense. They just pay it. The story illustrates what is wrong with pension and group health expenses. In our system, the state gets pension bills and just pays the tab. Our budget proposal shifts costs closer to home so people can question the expenses and deal with them more directly. Now, under the current system, they have no incentive to manage costs because the state picks them up, no matter what they are. When people are responsible for paying the bill, there will be plenty of incentive to lower the costs. We will ask school districts to begin sharing the cost of their own normal cost pensions. We'll phase in the shift over four years in 25% increments per year. And give schools, and this is critically important, give schools and local governments the tools they need to more than offset the costs. That's critical. The tools include increased education funding, the power to dissolve or consolidate units of local government, and more flexibility in contracting, bidding, and sharing services. As a matter of fairness, the Chicago Public Schools will get the same offsets as all other school districts in the state, including its portion of the increase under the new funding formula. But recognizing that CPS got to keep the benefits of its special block grant in the base of our new funding formula, we propose that CPS absorb its normal pension costs as it did before last year. We will ask universities to pay their pension costs, also phased in over four years, and to pick up their health care costs with offset tools that include an additional $205 million in appropriations in fiscal year 19. These shifts will save the state $696 million this year. We recommend right-sizing employee health insurance plans so that government compensation is more in line with what taxpayers have who are paying for it. Today, we pay almost 90% of the premiums for government employee health insurance policies that are way more expensive than plans in the private sector. State government needs to do what every employer in Illinois has already done over the last 10 years, get its health care costs under control. Taxpayers shouldn't have to pay for government health insurance policies that are richer than ones they can afford for themselves. It's not fair. If we legislate 
group health insurance changes the way the Massachusetts legislature has already done, we can save Illinois taxpayers $470 million in general revenue funds this year and $560 million in all funds. We also need to reduce workers' compensation insurance costs. They are the highest in the Midwest, and they're pushing out our manufacturers. Business leaves the state to escape them or won't come to Illinois in order to avoid them. It's one of the reasons we're losing business and population to the states around our borders. If we reduce our rate to just the national average, businesses as well as local governments will benefit from lower costs. And we will create tens of thousands of new jobs over time. Not only would we have faster economic growth that would help keep our budgets balanced, but taxpayers would directly save tens of millions of dollars in lower government costs as well. And one final point. It is time, it is in fact past time, to actually sell the Thompson Center in Chicago. Without Without, without any extra fees or charges tacked on. These moves, many of which have been supported by the General Assembly in prior years, can alleviate a $1.3 billion annual burden on our taxpayers and release money that we can then spend on education, public safety, human services, and infrastructure in fiscal year 19. Now, I know this idea that we're putting forth of reforms to stimulate growth, it goes against Illinois' traditional budget approach, the one where you decide what to buy and then buy it, even if it means spending beyond your means. The fiscal year 18 budget, which you enacted last July over my veto, is running a huge deficit right now that proves the point. Unbalanced budgets this unbalanced budget that we're currently working in was built on the back of a $4.5 billion income tax increase, $6 billion in long-term debt, and a still increasing backlog of unpaid bills that's expected to be at $7.7 billion by the end of this fiscal year. Our, the, our approach, the approach we're recommending, is decidedly different. We see the budget as an opportunity to set priorities without spending beyond our means. It is a framework designed to spark a constructive dialogue on the steps we need to take to resolve the state's financial issues. Our mission is straightforward. Enact reforms. Be accountable. Deliver on our promises. Our goals align with the needs of our citizens. Provide the best education on earth for our children. Ensure justice and equality for the deserving but disadvantaged. Share compassion for our veterans, the elderly, our most vulnerable. Provide security for our communities and maintain and improve our streets and our bridges. Our guiding principle is this, only spend money we have and don't increase the tax burden on the people of Illinois. That, and the bottom line is this, we need reforms. We need to shift accountability so that we can put more resources into education, human services, public safety, and infrastructure. That's where our fiscal year 19 budget is focused. That's the outcome we want to produce. Our administration is an emphatic advocate for education investment. By enacting structural reforms, we will be able to spend a record $8.3 billion on pre-K to 12 education. That includes $350 million of new money distributed through our more equitable new funding formula. 
Pre-K to 12 funding has risen a cumulative $3.7 billion since I took office. We also will spend $454 million for early childhood education, up 55% since I became governor. This investment is critical to our future. The work world around us evolves as technology advances. The skills needed to succeed in our economy are dramatically different than they were just a decade ago. Our own manufacturing sector is a perfect example. Where once there were get-your-hands dirty assembly line jobs, workers must now be equipped to use computer-directed equipment, manage software to track inventory, and build intricate high-tech products. Our obligation to our next generation is to prepare them by the millions to fully participate in the workforce of the future. The bipartisan effort we produced last year to bring equity to our school funding formula was a key step. And the new Invest in Kids program has expanded education choices for tens of thousands of students. It's a great step forward. And our cabinet on children and youth helps children reach their 25th birthdays as engaged, educated, self-sufficient citizens with marketable skills for a meaningful career. Now, we must make higher education a critical priority, too. Illinois Public University enrollment declined by more than 50,000 students from 1991 to 2014 as tuition and fees increased. Our budget conflicts in recent years haven't helped that trend. This year, we bring an end to budget reductions for our university and community college systems. We add $100 million in capital funds to meet deferred maintenance needs. We maintain MAP grants at FY18 levels, but we lay the foundation for increased MAP funding in the future. We also recommend a capital grant to the University of Illinois for its Illinois Innovation Network and Discovery Partners Institute. This grant will leverage billions of dollars in private donations to the U of I and spur enterprise formation that will make us the envy of the technology centers on the East Coast and the West Coast. This capital investment could well be the biggest spark ever to ignite our economic growth engine. The Illinois Board of Higher Education is developing a single statewide strategic plan to make academic offerings more attractive to students and drive more efficiency in service offerings. We look forward to the results of their work. Compassion is in the DNA of Illinois. Our budget mirrors this fundamental attribute. With reforms to our pension and group health programs, we can provide resources for veterans, families, children, the elderly, the sick, and the ailing. This week, despite aggressive precautions and new water treatment systems, Legionella bacteria has infected two more patients at the Quincy Veterans Home. Early detection led to successful treatment, but the infections send a clear message. We need to have money, we need to move quickly to make structural changes to the facilities themselves to ensure protection for our veterans. Our Water Management Task Force met yesterday to begin a review of an engineering report on the home's water systems. We've allocated $50 million in capital improvements to be prepared to address their recommendations for Legionella control. To further help our veterans, we need to move forward as well and complete the long-delayed construction of a new 200-bed veterans home in Chicago. We expect to spend a billion dollars on child care assistance for families with incomes up to 185% of the federal poverty level. We will also increase funds for early intervention programs and developmental disabilities services. Our budget addresses a necessary commitment to our elder population. 
we maintain funding levels for programs that serve 62,000 community care program clients and provide adult protection and in-home services. We're shifting clients to managed care organizations administered by healthcare and family services with no change in services but big savings in cost. When it comes to children and youth, we have improved a fragmented system that wasted money and too often failed to help young people become successful adults. In the Department of Children and Family Services, the fiscal year 19 budget adds staff for intact family services to help deal with cases that present the highest risks for young children. DCFS has redesigned the adoption subsidy process. There was a 16% increase in adoptions and a 31% increase in guardianships in fiscal year 2017. That means nearly 2,200 children left state care and found homes last year. We've had an unacceptably high number of youth confined to psychiatric hospitals, to juvenile detention, to emergency shelters, and we're working hard to lower those populations and help those young people get better services. The principles of reform and accountability guide our approach to Medicaid as well. We've made significant structural changes in this program, most notably a more thoughtful shift to managed care, a move that will save taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars in the years ahead and help us hold providers more accountable for the quality of the care they deliver. Medicaid enrollment has slowed in recent years, but it still serves nearly one quarter of our population, about 3.1 million people. That number will stay essentially flat in fiscal year 19, and we have budgeted $14.2 billion to provide care for eligible patients. This takes into account more than $450 million that our task force has saved so far through fraud detection and prevention. We have also developed a comprehensive strategy to address behavioral health. It transforms payment and delivery models, increases managed care, enhances workforce capacity, and establishes greater accountability. We're working closely with the federal government to get approval of a Section 1115 waiver that will let us more efficiently and effectively treat our 800,000 Medicaid enrollees who suffer with mental health and behavioral health problems. Criminal justice reform is a priority for our administration. Structural reforms mean we can devote more resources to the people and programs that protect us from those who would do us harm. Two more Illinois State Police cadet classes will graduate this year, and the budget anticipates another class in fiscal year 19. That means up to 300 more state troopers on the force, work, working to keep people safe. Our budget addresses the opioid epidemic fully funding programs that enhance enforcement and addiction recovery. Some 28,000 offenders are released into our communities every year, but nearly half return to prison within three years. These rates of recidivism are just too high. Jobs are a key antidote to the challenge. So we've allocated $26.4 million for the operation of life skills job training reentry centers in Kiwani and Murfreesboro to help people get back to work instead of going back to prison. We will spend $36.4 million for mental health facilities at Joliet and Elgin, which will supplement the three residential treatment units at Pontiac, Logan, and Dixon. The fiscal year 19 budget provides $10.2 million for Adult Redeploy Illinois to promote community-based supervision. There is also $110 million in federal funds allocated to reduce crime and help victims get the services they need. For the fourth year in a row, we will deliver more capital for infrastructure projects. 
Our budget provides $2.2 billion in pay-as-you-go funds for the Department of Transportation's annual road program. Additionally, we will provide $511 million in new capital funds for other IDOT needs in fiscal year 19. That brings total new transportation infrastructure spending by our administration since 2016 to nearly $10 billion. We should finalize private investment in infrastructure improvements, like the I-55 managed lane project, where private investors are willing to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to build and manage new and improved highways. Our administration has been actively engaged in conversations over the last year with the White House and with the U.S. Department of Transportation about an infrastructure program. As the plan announced this week works its way through Congress, we will work closely with our Illinois congressional delegation to maximize the return on Illinois' investments in our infrastructure. All along, we've been clear about the necessity to meet critical public needs with the resources available to us. The surest way to do that is to enact reforms that bend the cost curve of government down and stimulate our economy to bring new jobs to Illinois. The key to balanced budgets is to have our economy grow faster than our government spending. I vetoed the fiscal year 18 budget because it was unbalanced because it did not provide reforms needed to end deficits, to achieve balanced budgets, and sustain economic growth. Unfortunately, I was right in that veto. We were forced to spend more than a billion dollars to meet obligations set into law prior, but were underappropriated in the budget that was passed. Now, need to pass a supplemental spending bill to cover these costs. This sort of budget shortfall underscores the urgency of our circumstances. We simply have to slow the growth of government spending and grow our economy faster. Higher tax rates can never fix this structural necessity. Our fiscal year 19 proposal asks you to engage with us to make sensible, long overdue reforms, to shift control to the people who pay the bills. Move pension and health care costs where they belong. Most importantly, give local governments the tools to cut costs. Reduce workers' comp rates. Sell the Thompson Center. These savings will produce a surplus to put against our bill backlog. Better yet, they will energize our economy. If you'll work with me to take the next logical step and pass true pension reform, we will be able to enact a nearly $1 billion tax cut and start rolling back the income tax rate. And let's face it, middle class wage earners and young mobile workers, for them, the pension crisis is not about the politics that's played out here in Springfield. It's about how much money we're taking out of their pockets. The people of Illinois are taxed out. A billion-dollar income tax cut should be our number one objective by the end of this session. <laughs> Together, let's, let's learn from our past. Let's talk honestly about the future and move ahead and make Illinoisans the big winners. Our budget proposal is a framework, balances the interests of those who spend our taxes with those who pay the taxes. It balances the need for reform with the time we need to implement it. And it produces the tools we need to reduce the associated costs. We're ready to collaborate on reforms that benefit the taxpayers of Illinois. Our ideas are here for you to consider. We share a sense of urgency with you and every citizen of our state. We welcome a call to the table for serious conversations together about how to proceed. Our intent in this week of Lincoln's birthday is to heed his admonition. The leading rule is diligence. Leave nothing for tomorrow which can be done today. 
This is the essence of Illinois' work ethic, the essence of our value system. Let's do this budget. Let's fix our system. Let's give fiscal integrity to our people. Let's roll back the tax hike and give power and prosperity back to the people of Illinois. Thank you. God bless you all. God bless our veterans. God bless the people of Illinois. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Yeah, You're hard to hear. hear you. You're hard to hear. So talk loudly. This is live coverage of reaction to Governor Bruce Renner's annual budget message on Illinois Public Television and Radio. I'm Jack Titchener, along with CapitalFacts.com publisher Rich Miller and Amanda Vinicky of Channel 11 Chicago tonight. It strikes me that in this particular uh, budget message, there was a lot more detail than we normally get in terms of these addresses. We've heard three of them. This is the fourth one. There was a lot more, if you will, substance in there about what he intends to do with the budget money and how he intends to actually, uh, actually implement it. Yeah, and um, he came up with a tax cut idea. Give him credit. I mean, it's uh, it's based on a constitutionally iffy idea uh, of a pension reform. Uh, but it seems like there's no harm in voting for it because if it if it does pass constitutional muster, uh, it, it frees up you know close to a billion dollars. So we'll see if uh, the Democrats go along with that. There wasn't a lot of surprise. Uh, there was a lot of applause, but they they have some time to to think about it. I mean, Jack, you're right. I think you don't hear a lot of detail in these speeches, and it's something that we knock governors for, and I don't mean just Rauner, but that's pretty typical. I mean, this is a governor gets kind of two chances, really, every year to speak to the people in mass, and who wants to go through a spreadsheet during that point in time? But, so it's, you know, more an opportunity for soaring rhetoric. You're right, he did touch on a lot of plans, things that aren't going to earn, I think, anybody a lot of Clause, a pension cost shift, you know, what even is that? What does it mean? But as you noted, um, this is something that keeps talking about the consideration model that the governor has been calling for, that Democrats did talk about. And I think that is yet again a demonstration of how much, frankly, the sides don't like each other in that despite that, it hasn't happened. It's interesting, too, what he's done is he's thrown a couple of bones to Senator Cullerton and Speaker Madigan. Madigan talked about that cost shift years ago. Uh, for school pensions. Uh, President Cullerton, of course, has had that uh, pension reform plan that he says can gen up a billion it's dollars, possible. the governor. I mean, it's possible. Uh, anything's possible, I guess, and, and they're not screaming at each other, so that's fine. Representative Dave McSweeney, a Republican from the suburbs, just texted me that he's already filed a resolution opposing the cost shift, uh, pension cost shift, to local school districts because it would, uh, in his words, raise property taxes. I think, you know, there, there are some other things in this budget that are worthwhile. There's $7 billion in, in capital programs, new, uh, that we'll have to take a look at. It's funded mainly from uh, borrowing. Um, uh, so, we'll, and, and there's uh, $2 billion in pay-as-you-go on that. So, I'm not sure exactly how he's going to pay for all this stuff yet. But, I mean, it's, it's definitely worth a look. There was a point, and I don't know if you caught it or not, there was a line that was written much different than it came out of his mouth, where he said there was a billion dollar hole in the budget and you need to fix it. Now, that's how it read. And when he said it, he almost, you didn't hear the word you, almost like it was we need to fix it. There was a lot less confrontation in that speech than there could have been. Rich Miller, we appreciate your time and your expertise, insights on Illinois lawmakers. All the best to you. I know you've got a busy afternoon plan. Yes. And we'll continue with this live edition of Illinois Lawmakers. Amanda, there was scattered applause from time to time when we talked about that, when we heard about that uh, uh, billion dollar tax cut. The House Republicans, the Senate Republicans were very happy to hear that. But uh, we're going to hear in just a moment from the Senate president that uh, we may not be all that close to that. You know, um, to be honest, I feel like these speeches, it's such a marked difference from the first budget address that Governor Rauner gave, where Republicans were almost gleeful, boisterous in their applause. And this, 
yes, they of course applauded at the notion of a tax cut, but um, that was not the major takeaway of the speech. And there wasn't a ton of applause, even from the Republican side. It's really a different tone, and I think you can't help but notice that. We're joined now on the program by Senate President John Cullerton, Democrat of Chicago. Good to have you back with us. Thank you. What, what's your reaction to what the governor had to say today? Uh, it was deceptive. Uh, we met with the governor this morning. He said he wanted to roll back taxes. Uh, he said he wanted to put more money into education. Uh, this bill, this proposal does not roll back any taxes and it doesn't, it puts less money into education. That's what's really so deceptive about it. I, I mentioned to him this morning that he had been going around saying he was against last year's tax increase and, and yet he's spending all of it in this budget. He's not talking about getting rid of it at all. In fact, it makes his budget uh, challenge a lot, a lot easier. You said coming out of the leaders' meeting this morning, the first one that you've had in over a year with the governor and the other leaders, that he was at least, this budget's at least a billion five out of whack. Well, or because at. he's asking us to pass and laws that his own Republicans will not vote for. He wants to take money away from state employees, money away from state employees' pensions, money away from their health care. Uh, he wants to cut uh, money for education. They're not going to vote for that. That's, that's what, where he claims he has a balanced budget. So that's why we've totaled about, about $1.5 billion in cuts that will not pass uh, because his own members won't want to do it. And, and you're also looking at something where somewhere in the neighborhood of $9 billion in back bills. Oh, it's We're more paying than that. down some. It's more than that. So he says there's a, he said he's paying back, let, let's show you how deceptive it is. He's got money to pay down old bills. $350 million. We owe $9 billion plus $6 billion that we borrowed to a bank. So it's like $14 billion that we owe. If we did save money on pensions, wouldn't we want to have our vendors get paid sooner than nine months? That, that's why it's so deceptive. It's an election year statement that he wants to be able to say he's lowering taxes. He vetoed the bill last year that gave him the money that he's using to, to have the budget that he has right now. Is there anything in the budget address that you could embrace that you could see passing this year that Illinois can afford? Well, first of all, I just have to point out again, it's not as bad as it's been in the past because of the money that was raised last year when he, in his own budget, said, work together with the Senate grand bargain. The other thing is that these reforms that he talked about, at this, that we should pass, workers' comp and those other things, we tried to pass those last year. The pension reform was in the pension bill that we passed. It's all part of the grand bargain. And he's bargain. the one that undermined the grand bargain. That's why he's so unpopular. You talked about Massachusetts. I had to, to think about the fact that the governor of Massachusetts, who's a Republican, is at like a 65% approval rating. He can't be defeated. This guy is probably one of the most unpopular governors in, 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 the, in the state. So let's take it from in the nation. there. It was part of the grand bargain deal that the governor took off the table. Is that dead, or can you return to that point? His is own, it too late? His own members are not going to vote for it. So he's got all of these uh, Republicans, so many of whom are, are leaving, but the central and southern Illinois, they have, they're have prison guards, they're teachers. Um, they're, they're not going to vote uh, to take away the, these pensions. That was possible when it was part of a, of a grand bargain, which he uh, rejected. And let's face it, his own Republican leader in the Senate left because of what he did. Uh, by pulling the plug out from underneath that. Let's dig into those numbers a little bit. Uh, he's estimating that you could save up to $900 million a year with that uh, pension reform plan that you first put forward. Yes, and we, and we actually passed the bill out of the Senate. And it would, first of all, go through courts, even if it was constitutional, which I think it is, it would then have to be implemented. People have to make elections. This could in no way be, be done in fiscal year 19, or maybe even fiscal year 20. Okay? And there'll be even more opposition to it because it was passed last year as part of a, of a deal that he rejected. Another Democrat idea that was once floated by Speaker Madigan uh, a while back was this idea of cost shifting some of the pensions. It, it, it's true. We were supportive of the concept of cost shift. But to, uh, once again, to show you how intentionally deceptive this guy has been, he actually talked about uh, Chicago being treated fairly. Under his proposal, we're going to spend $4 billion on the pensions for suburban and downstate school districts and nothing for Chicago. That's what his proposal is. So it's just hard to believe what he says when he gives a speech like this. So what do you see a budget looking like? If his proposal is basically dead right away, 
what would we see a budget look like? A lot like this year's? Well, it, it's going to be obviously easier than it was the last two years. We stopped the bleeding. Uh, it, it, we have to somehow make up uh, about a billion and a half dollars. The, by the way, last year he talked about the, balance, the budget wasn't balanced. We passed his pension reform bills, a, a different pension reform. We passed it. It was supposed to say $500 million. It wasn't implemented in time for the systems. Number two, the revenues were down by half a, half a billion dollars. So it, it's not our fault that that happened. That, that's why uh, it wasn't balanced last year. I really don't know what... We're going to have to sit down and go through this uh, in more detail. This is the first time we heard about it today. But it's not balanced. The things that he's proposing are going to be very difficult to pass. We couldn't even get his own members to vote for it. Well, you know, we were talking about that uh, cost shift. The way that the bill was originally written uh, was it would take up to 14 years to do that. Exactly. More money would come in. Normal, this is a over a four-year period. Normal cost is about a 6% of, of, of payroll. And it's not a bad idea to shift it back to local district. That's what Chicago has been doing for uh, forever. Okay? And so, uh, it, but he wants to do it in, in a much quicker way. The, the contracts that are negotiated with this, the teachers' unions, they're already in place. Some of those are 10 years old. So all of a sudden, he's going to start sending a new bill to the school district and say, now you owe more than what we're giving you under the school aid formula. That's a cut to education. It, it only results in perhaps property tax increases in the suburbs especially. And so it's, that's just a bad idea. You know, you mentioned that you did meet with the governor before he gave this speech. He laid out the broad strokes of his plan. What is the significance that he finally called a meeting? Did he express why now, and will you be meeting again, tackling uh, that one point five well, billion dollar I, hole? I, I, it's so frustrating to go to these meetings. I'm glad he called it. Um, I, I thanked him for inviting us, but then he just doesn't seem he doesn't engage. He doesn't seem to know really what's in the budget. He's got a budget director there. I asked some questions. There's still some. There's still a one point two billion dollars of reappropriation from last year I can't figure out whether that's additional debt or whether that's counted for so there's just so many questions that I, I think I think the four legislative leaders meeting can be much more productive than meeting with the government I think that that one billion dollars he was talking about that was money that was needed to keep the Department of Corrections open so he's talking about supplement obligations that he signed but we didn't appropriate so the question I have is and we really just have to find out is it is it accounted for in the budget, or is it additional debt that we still have to make up for? That's the problem. That would take that one point five billion dollar figure to what? Two point five billion dollars. Two point six, exactly. That's why we have such a problem. Could some of the motivation for this tax rollback be? Uh... Let me just stop you. We know the motivation for the tax <laughs> rollback. He's at running for re-election. Well, I was getting to that. I that's was getting to that. It's, that's what it's all about. This speech was drafted by a pollster. Because most of the Democratic candidates are, are for governor are talking about moving to a graduated income tax, like most states do that actually have income taxes. If there's a graduated income tax, it would take two years for that to be enacted. And so it's something I support, but it would take two years. When he talks about these other states, we make more money than all these other states around us. Wisconsin has much higher taxes than we do. So does Iowa. So does Indiana, by the way. It's, it's more expensive in Indianapolis than it is in to pay income tax in Chicago. It, so the, it, it's, it's such a deceptive way of talking. It's, it, it's interesting you raise that point about how Illinois is richer by far than its neighbors. If you looked at the gross domestic product for Illinois, it's about $800 billion a year. It's, it's gigantic. Well, I, I'll tell you, in my district, things are doing very well. Chicago has been... Uh, considered by Amazon to be a place to move to. I'd, I'd say we're in the top three in the nation. There's a reason for that. We're about, about to wrap up, but your your view toward the end of the session, you were saying a little bit uh, earlier to Amanda that since you have the tax increase in, in place still, we're in a better position to get through this without another impasse? We went for two years where we spent $7 billion more than we had. That's why we owe $16 billion, $14 billion. So the only positive thing I can tell you is we're not going to do it again this year. We're not going to overspend by $7 billion. That's about the most optimistic thing I can say about this budget. Senate, Senate President John Cullerton, always a pleasure to have you on the program, sir. Thanks very much Thank for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, President. Amanda, based on what we just heard from Senator Cullerton as we get ready to uh, take another guest here, uh, this is going to be an awfully big uphill climb to get any of this or much of this implemented. Uh, that is putting it mildly, I think. As you heard from the president, 
it is not just going to be with Democrats. That is most certainly an issue. Cannot repeat enough that this election on the horizon makes the dynamic to do anything extremely difficult. But a lot of what the governor is talking about it's going to be hard for Republicans to pass as well, and that is because some come from districts where they are already in trouble. They are allied with, say, unions, public employee unions, also education. And they are going to say that, um, as we heard, Representative McSweeney, who is a supporter of Rauner Challenger State Representative Jeannie Ives, saying that that would just result in higher property taxes because, of course, it is local property taxes that pay for school's budget. So yes, we're going to see that difficulty. I guess now we can hear some of that perhaps from what, Senator what, Bill Let's Brady. hear some of, the, some of the optimism from Senate uh, Republican leader uh, uh, Bill Brady, Republican of Bloomington. You came out of that leaders meeting a bit more, a lot more upbeat than Senator Cullerton did. Well, um, it's a political game here we're in, but I, you know, the governor faced various challenges. Uh, the current budget we're in, that he vetoed, knowing it was out of balance, is out of balance. It left a huge backlog of unpaid bills. Uh, it imposed a tax on the people of Illinois that has driven businesses out of Illinois. And uh, I think he's come up with a great blueprint. Number one thing, what I'm most optimistic about is it's, it's balanced. This budget is balanced. Secondly, uh, the governor said, hold the line on taxes. He knows that it's difficult to bring Amazon to a state that's gonna continue to increase taxes and other companies. So. In our meeting today with Speaker Madigan and President Culleton and Leader Durkin and the governor, the governor said, we need to work together in a bipartisan way. I've laid out a blueprint that's balanced. Uh, my only absolutes are it's got to be balanced. He's laid one out. I'm sure there are things in this budget that the governor doesn't particularly care for, and there's things that other people don't. But I think it's a good start. It's a fair and equitable way to get us to a balanced budget. I think your uh, Republican uh, colleague, uh, Jim Durkin, the House Republican leader, put it this way. This is a starting point. This is where we begin the negotiations for what has to happen to get us through the fiscal year that starts on Gen uh, July 1 of next this year. Yeah. I don't know any governor who's introduced a budget today uh, and had it actually become enacted. So, yes, we need input. We need bipartisan input to make sure we're meeting the bipartisan needs of the state. But it has to be balanced, and, and there, are no, there are no gimmicks in this. Uh, there is fair and equitable sharing of bringing us into balance, which hopefully will lead us to surpluses that will give us even, even more money to invest. Well, you call it balanced. We just had President Cullerton sitting in the chair that you're in now saying that, no, this in fact is not, he says that it is a deceptive plan, number one, because there's no way you can roll back the taxes. So let's start there, that this is, is this just, yeah. Uh, something that is easy and kind of nice yeah. to say to voters before an election, we're going to roll back your taxes some, yeah. but it's not feasible. But this budget is not predicated on rolling back the taxes or pension reforms that would have to meet the test of the Supreme Court. What the governor has done, I think brilliantly, is he said, pass President Colton's pension reforms that will save a billion dollars, and those monies can be used to roll back the tax. That's off budget. So that idea, President Colton's pension reform, saving a billion dollars and giving it back to the taxpayers by reducing the onerous tax that was imposed on them last year. But that's not part of the budget. The budget is based on revenues under current law and then readjusting expenditures, uh, living within our means and we are prioritizing our spending, I think, in a fair way. Is it fair, however, for the governor to constantly criticize the tax increase, talk about vetoing it, and yet have a budget proposal that, as you just noted, relies yeah. on that very tax increase. Well, but he has called off budget for Senator Colleton's pension reform that would roll that back. The governor's out there trying to be our chief salesman. He's trying to bring Amazon. He's brought other companies here, but he knows it's difficult with the tax increase that was imposed last year. Uh, he also knows that the Democrats who passed that tax increase through their budget and their spending and plan and some Republicans, but it was it was Speaker Madigan's budget. I mean, there's no question about it. We thought we had negotiated a bipartisan program, but at the end of the day, Speaker Madigan passed his budget. Right, wrong, or indifferent, and you're right, some Republicans voted for it. He's The governor, I think, is being realistic that to roll that tax back was going to require some savings. He's, he's targeted Senator Colton's pension reform. He's also targeted programs that Speaker Madigan has proposed before, and that is holding local governments, school districts accountable 
for costs that they put off on the state. This is something that uh, is a good program because it'll help them manage those costs. But this isn't unique to, to Republican Governor Bruce Rauner. This is within a proposal that Speaker Madigan has proposed in the past. Well, in, in fairness, though, that proposal was phased in over a 14-year period as the uh, money was ramped up for it. You're talking about a four-year plan now with 25% per year that goes back on to local school districts and I for oppose the most part. I oppose that proposal, and I'll tell you why I oppose that proposal. That also shifted legacy liabilities and costs, which are grand and shouldn't be shifted to local government. This only shifts the cost of the normal cost, which is the current year cost of the pension. So what we did is we took the proposal the Speaker Madigan, or the governor did, and we said, okay, legacy costs aren't fair. It's not fair to ask those school districts, as Speaker Madigan was doing over 14 years, to pay that $130 billion in unfunded liability, but it is fair for them to manage salaries, realizing the salaries have a pension cost associated with them. But if you look at this from the standpoint of, let's say, but someone in Can I go back okay. to that for a minute? Please, go Even ahead. with that, the governor is increasing education funding to offset that cost by over $350 million in accordance with the education reform package that we passed last year. So it's not like he's just saying, pay this, forget everything else. Increasing funding by $350 million plus dollars. But at the same time, local school districts are going to have to fork over more money for that putting more of the burden back on the local property tax owners or property taxpayers and we're already we're yeah. already neck and neck with New Jersey and having the highest property taxes in the country. You're right. But the increase in funding exceeds the local school districts realization of the phase in of the normal costs. How will you get particularly Democrats from Chicago to be on board with that considering that just fast just passed education funding proposal catches CPS yeah. up with all the other school districts in the state, they have their own legacy costs that Illinois will keep on carrying under this proposal for other school districts, but not for CPS yeah. while putting this new burden back onto CPS right away. Well, it's a, it's a matter of equity. Those legacy costs were created when Chicago, want, Chicago Public Schools wanted to have their own pension system and didn't want the state to touch it. So uh, that was decided, and money was given to Chicago for pensions in past years in other ways to meet those obligations to provide equity. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think it's a fair and equitable program. Every, more money goes to education than ever before. That helps the city of Chicago. That helps the rest of the state. Uh, it balances our budget. If Chicago wants to grow and attract companies like Amazon, we have to have a balanced budget. Uh, and we have to have a plan to reduce the property, the property tax burden and the income tax burden. This budget provides that. One of the things that uh, President Cullerton touched on a little earlier was, he said some of these things will be very difficult for downstate Republicans to vote for, like cutting, uh, taking, uh, let's say, the insurance premium negotiations out of collective bargaining negotiations. There are a lot of union employees who vote Republican at correctional centers and state garages and the like right. downstate. How is that going to, how's that going, how are you going to sell that? Well, I think you sell it by saying this is commensurate with private sector health plans. It is commensurate with the average, I believe, of other public sector health plans. And it's fair. I mean, we're not shifting. The state is still maintaining the majority cost of the health insurance plans for state employees. This is very fair and reasonable, I believe. And by helping realize the management cost of these health insurance programs, I think in the long run it's going to give more freedom to state workers because there will be more money to increase pay in other areas. What about what about for retired teachers and other retired state employees uh, ratcheting down the amount that the state pitches in for their premiums? Yeah, This isn't easy. There's a lot of programs in here. I, I authored the first teachers retirement system health insurance plan uh, way back when. I don't like to see the challenges we're facing affect that adversely. But we were left with a billion, over $2 billion in a structural deficit. I think the governor's approach, although I don't agree with all of it, I think the governor's approach is fair and balanced. And I think uh, it will give us a good starting blueprint uh, for the General Assembly to work with the administration to come up with a balanced budget in a timely fashion if my colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to work together. 
I think the governor showed that he wants to work together uh, by reaching out and discussing this today with, with both Democratic leaders. Uh, I think it was a, a fruitful beginning to a process that we're all going to have to focus on. Do you doubt that willingness to collaborate? No, I, I, you know, I look at. I meant by, by Democrats, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. no, mm -hmm. I know the governor Reiner wants to. He he wanted to in the education reform that we passed in a bipartisan way. We achieved that. I, I believe that Speaker Madigan and I believe that President Colton want to do that. I don't think anyone wants to go into an election cycle, an election year, without a balanced budget. Are there going to have to be tough decisions like this General Assembly has had to make before? Absolutely. Not everyone's going to be happy, but if we don't make these decisions, I promise you, everyone's going to be a lot more unhappy uh, down the road. The governor today proposed uh, nearly $8 billion in new capital uh, construction. A lot of that's geared toward universities that have uh, what we call deferred maintenance, which means letting stuff... Right. Letting stuff go. Letting stuff go. Where's, where's the revenue stream for that? Senator? Well, some of it comes from ongoing capital programs. Uh, it's it's one-time revenues. You could you could tie it to maybe the Thompson Center sale or other one-time revenues. Isn't that part of this year's budget already, though? Well, we we've conceded pretty much that that's not going to happen this year. So it's been put off to the next year, hoping we can pass. And I think the Democrats, I had Democrats tell me, yes, we need to sell the Thompson Center uh, down on the floor today. And so those expenditures. But what the governors realized is, I, I think rightly so, Governors Bogoyevich and Quinn have attacked higher education. Higher education is a foundational value for economic development and job creation. And if we don't reinvest in this tech center uh, on, the, on the river of Chicago is going to be one of the most fantastic opportunities I think we have for job creation. Businesses are looking for that. We have to better leverage our institutions of higher education. And it's not just Chicago, by the way, it's Rockford, Peoria, uh, Springfield, other communities that will benefit from this, but all of higher ed will benefit. The governor realizes that our, our, our students, our young adults in our state needs that boost for higher Doesn't education. Doesn't the governor and Republicans wear a lot of that jacket for also decimating higher education during the budget impasse? Well, clearly it was one of the few things the courts didn't rule you had to fund. So it fell by the wayside. Uh, but the governor was arguing. But it started under Bogoyevich and continued under Governor Quinn. Senate Republican Leader Bill Brady, thanks for being with us today. Always a pleasure to have you on the program. Uh, always a happy you. warrior for the Republican cause. Good to be with you. Illinois lawmakers. Thanks, Jack. Thanks very much, sir. Amanda, uh, basically, from what we heard from uh, the Senate Republican Leader uh, Bill Brady there, uh, there's considerable belief on their side of the aisle that this package is still doable, that they can get Democratic Party buy-in to make this thing happen. We've both been here, I won't say how many years collectively, but it's been a long time. <laughs> yes. um, do, do, do you think the Democrats will feel the love on this? I think it was clear from what we heard from President um, Cullerton there. We're going to hear more now from House Democrats. Uh, I, I don't expect it. Uh, Democrats are going to feel the love on this. I mean, when it comes down to it, no matter what, there are going to be a lot of hard choices that need to be made. There is still a bit of a budget hangover, let's call it, from the impasse from, yes, Illinois now has a budget, but there is outstanding deficit. So there is a whole lot to do. All that is going to be hard, but the governor, are, are Democrats going to take his lead? Well, let's Well, let's see. ask one. One of, the, one of the sharpest pencils in the drawer when it comes to budgeting is State Representative Greg Harris, Democrat of Chicago. He's an assistant majority leader here. Good to have you on the program. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. Hello, Amanda. Hi, How are you? Th well, thanks, well. thanks for being patient. We know you've been waiting in the wings for a little bit. Your takeaway from today's budget message, uh, there's a billion dollar tax rollback thanks to potential pension reform and cost shifting away to local governments where the, the money's being spent. What do you think is going to happen with this? Well, I noticed a couple aisle? things about the speech today. I noticed the tone was a little less antagonistic, which I think is a good sign if he's if the governor really wants to collaborate with all of us, not to get out and you know name call and make accusations like we've seen in the past. So I thought that was good. But a lot of the savings the governor uh, is, says he needs to balance his budget and to bring about all these great things is going to take a lot of legislative cooperation, and maybe they realize that. 
you know, there's $1.7 billion of savings in his budget that cannot be done without legislative authority. We will have to pass separate laws to authorize that. So he cannot realize that savings unless he comes to us. He mentioned the $1.1 billion in spending he did uh, above and beyond the $38 billion we gave him this year. That's a $1.1 billion debt he generated, which there's no revenue source for. He's going to have to come to us and either say, give a, raise more taxes for me so I can pay down my bills that I ran up, or it's going to go into the debt. Uh, the pension solution that he mentioned is another item that uh, the governor cannot do on his own. He will have to come uh, to the legislature and get a majority. And that may be a three-year pathway to uh, you know, realizing any savings from that pension reform because it's going to be litigated. It's going to go all sure, the way sure. up to the Supreme Court, and it may turn out to be a nothing burger by the time it gets done. Uh, absolutely. So you know, we have to be very careful when you count these savings. So they're real and they're, they're going to accrue to us this year. You know, you s talked about the governor needing to go to you, the legislature, of course, dominated by Democrats. Is any of that swallowable? I mean, in a sense, he, you could say he has gone to you by presenting this proposal in a very public fashion this very day. What of it is well, something well, what, that you think saw, Democrats could stop? What we saw was a broad outline. Uh, now we'll need to see the details. Exactly how are you going to you know, implement this? We saw the proposal to shift costs mammoth amount of costs in the billions from state government on to local school districts. And I think a lot of people are going to think, what does this mean for my local school district if suddenly, you know, millions or tens or hundreds of millions of dollars uh, now have to be accounted for out of our local budget that we've never seen before? Is it property tax increases locally that uh, this will require? Is it laying off of staff that uh, the governor's proposal will require? We just need to see other details. It that. was interesting. I talked to someone who had a hand in negotiating the uh, school reform funding bill uh, earlier, and he said, well, depending on where you are with your adequacy level in terms of funding, it might mean that uh, you're going to have to spend a lot more money at the local level because of that burden being shifted. Or in other cases, you may be getting some money and it might end up being a wash. You don't really gain any traction or any ground. That's possible. And I think every rep and every senator is going to have to look at these really complicated changes he's trying to make and things we just settled. You know, before the dust has even settled and school districts have had a chance to take advantage of their new funding, suddenly it's being juggled again. And I think a lot of people are going to w want to see, am I a winner? Am I a loser? How does my district come out? How does this work with the city of Chicago, in particular with Chicago Public Schools? You've had this interesting situation there for many years. Well, that where was the surprising thing in the yeah. speech to me, is that after this last year where we reached this monumental agreement on the education funding, you know, which of course the governor vetoed and then it was overridden, one of the key things that was an ingredient there was how Chicago was treated. And he today, in his budget proposal, is saying, I'm just rolling all that back. I'm just going to wipe the scully clean. We're going to pretend it never happened. And that you, you are not going to get people in Chicago to sit still for that. And you're doing this over a four-year period as opposed to a 14-year period. That was a model that was suggested earlier by the Senate President John Cullerton and Speaker Madigan. And I think, you know, it, it, if, if you do things gradually and allow systems to adjust, I, I think that's a more sensible way to go than doing it in such a compressed fashion, very suddenly, with huge amounts of cost shifted in the first couple of years. That, that, that's just going to be too much for a small school district or municipality or even a larger municipality to absorb. We have been talking about just how a lot of this seems not very feasible given the, um, I, I don't call it animosity, that still seems to be residually there from the past couple of years and all of the partisan fighting that led to the impasse. And on top of that, of course, with the election coming up. Is there, even if you could get past some of these agreements regularly, is this an impossible year to have those very tough asks? Well, but, but look at the look at the biggest things that have happened down here or that are about to happen down here in the last couple months. You've had education reform done on a bipartisan basis with Republicans and Democrats coming together in both chambers and saying this has to be done for the people of Illinois, and we did it. We looked at the, uh, the situation the governor left us in with two, near, two years of no budgets. And Democrats and Republicans from uh, both chambers came together from across Illinois. 
we did it. You know, it was a tough thing to do. It was a tough vote to take, but we stabilized it. Right now, we're working on the hospital assessment program, three and a half billion dollars of federal money that's coming into our state uh, to fund health care and hospitals. Republicans and Democrats are working hand in hand to get this done, the legislative re Republicans and Democrats. So when, when we get together as, as members of our caucuses, we can get a lot of work done. You're, you're an expert on health care appropriations, and in particular, that hospital assessment program. That's critical for the safety net to hospitals in the state of Illinois. What Actually, will every hospital in Illinois benefits from it. This is a program that dates back from uh, the 1990s when the federal government gave states ways to bring in new federal dollars. This year it's worth $3.5 billion to the state of Illinois that we're at risk of losing come June 30th if we have not worked out a solution which has passed both chambers, got signed by the governor, then goes to Washington, they have to sign off on it. So the chambers have done their work and we're just hoping the governor will do his part too. President Trump of course has submitted his budget to Congress. Where do we stand with regard to the Medicaid system in the state of Illinois? There's, there's been concern about the Medicaid expansion that took place under the Affordable Care Act not uh, continuing. Well, an another th uh, part of the governor's budget he introduced, he didn't get up and announce this from the podium because I don't think a lot of people have seen it as good news. He's planning to cut 4% from all the rates for all the health care providers in the state of Illinois. And that 4% just you know, across the board cuts to hospitals, doctors, uh, health centers, you know, all kinds of medical providers. You're, you're, that, that's going to be pretty devastating to a lot of these people. You know, as you noted, there's a lot more to this budget than we heard in that yeah. speech. While the governor did talk about increased funding for criminal justice programs, for example, a new adoption program, and so on, there's a whole lot of cuts that weren't mentioned. But I know well, that you've had the opportunity to look at some of those numbers. Well, I would say, you know, as I listened to the governor speak about his commitment to higher education and his commitment to human services and his commitment to our colleges and universities, I added to the end of each one of those phrases, which I vetoed, which I vetoed, which I vetoed, because he has continually vetoed those appropriations. Um, so I, I hope this year there is a change of tone. You know, certainly we're going to go through the budget. We're going to work through it with our Republican friends. And there will be parts that we can all agree on. Uh, but at the end of the day, the governor has to sign it. What sort of cuts are we looking at, though, in Illinois, given that despite the tax increase, there are still an unbalanced budget or at least carryover from last year's budget are we going to see cuts and where do you see those happening well, the the biggest things out there we have to deal with are the billion dollars in interest on past due bills that we have accumulated uh, during governor Reiner's term we've got the debt which went up as high as 16 billion dollars in the last two years we're now whittling that down you have the 1.1 billion in unauthorized spending that he did and you then have the $1.7 billion in changes he wants to make that are going to take legislative approval. So those are big numbers. If you can't solve those, there is no way you can cut your way out of things by nickel and diming you know, senior homes and school districts and that kind of thing. In the, next, in the last 30 seconds we have, are we headed for another budget impasse this year, or is there the willpower to get through this despite the challenges you've just outlined? I think there's a will among the caucuses to sit down and work together and come to a, 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 a compromise. Representative Harris, thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it as always. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we continue on this special live edition of Illinois Lawmakers and Illinois Public Television and Illinois Public Radio, along with my colleague from WTTW in the Windy City, Amanda Vinicky. So we're getting both sides of the argument here. Uh, Democrats, of course, highly skeptical that a lot of these things can be achieved in the next few months in terms of that uh, budget blueprint uh, outlined by uh, Governor Rauner today, while Republicans largely upbeat and saying this is a great place to start from to get this thing done. They're saying it's a great place to start and yet, um, I mean really, Jack, as, as you noted there, I think we have two big takeaways and one is how much the governor's budget relies on these controversial, very difficult to pass programs and yet as we just heard from Representative Harris there, the major billions of dollars of outstanding questions, which means if not that, then what? So while you hear that skepticism from Democrats, where are they going to look for savings in the billions? If it's not going to be nickel and diming cuts, where? Well, we have someone to ask that very question or set of questions up. 
And that is uh, House Republican Leader Jim Durkin of Western Springs. Great to have you on the program. Thank you. Glad to be back. You came out of that leaders meeting today very upbeat. You said, despite the fact that, uh, of course, Senator Cullerton was saying this is a billion off, five off already. You're like, no, oh, this is a great place to start from. A budget address is a starting point for every governor going back decades and going back to the inception of this state. This is the blueprint that the governor has asked us to work from. Uh, people should not be jumping too quick to say that this is a horrible, uh, horrible document or proposal. This is a start. And I went into the meeting this morning not quite sure what to expect, but I walked out with at least the impression that there is a willingness on behalf of the Democrat leadership to work with us. I may be an eternal optimist. I've been around here a few times, but I don't believe that the caucuses on the Democrat side, the House and the Senate, are going to go down this road where we're going to have this impasse, and they're going to insist that the leaders try to work this thing out over the next few months. There's some Democrat ideas in the governor's proposal. One, of course, is Senator Cullerton's idea of consideration for uh, state uh, state retirees yes. in terms of uh, how that could uh, generate upwards of a billion dollars in uh, pension savings. Now, it's a long haul between now and the time we actually see that. Well, you know what? I introduced that bill last year, uh, House Bill 4027. And, and not only did I introduce it, but I have 25 co-sponsors on the bill. It means there's 26 Republicans who are right out of the gate are ready to support it. When we have controversial bills, important ones, we generally have what we call as a structured roll call, where we have, where the speaker and I decide that we all have responsibilities to put on certain votes. So based on the numbers that are in the House, 26 is really the number that I need to produce on a very difficult, any difficult issue. I've got my votes ready to go on a pension reform bill that reflects what President Cullerton introduced three years ago as an alternative to Senate Bill 1, which the union supported. So you think that one is good to go out of the gate? The House Republicans are prepared to put the votes on it right now. Harder, a harder sell, though, is that cost shift back down to local school boards when it comes to that, uh, that pension obligation. That's going to be a tough one because you're basically saying, hey, I'm asking for higher property taxes in a state that is neck and neck with New Jersey with, with, with regard to that. Well, I have talked to my superintendents, and they know that there has been discussion about moving the cost back onto the school districts. But they've said that if you allow us to phase it in over time, then we can budget for it. No one likes to, to have anything cut. We know that, and but we do believe that this is an area that the state needs to basically weed themse wean themselves off and put the responsibilities back on the locals. And as the governor said, this is an opportunity for local districts to be able to manage their resources and be more austere with the spending. A lot, I, I've got great schools, but also people love their schools, but they also know that the largest tax line on their itemized line on their tax bill comes from their schools as well. You know, President Cullerton earlier said, while the idea of the pension consideration model and also the shifting of pension costs from the state to local school districts is one that Democrats may have backed previously, it's too difficult to really do that now, he alluded, given that that was part of a grand bargain. The governor took that off the table too late. I, 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 I disagree with President Cullerton. I've seen over time that if the Democrats want to do something, they find the votes. It's not just going to be Democrats alone. It's going to be Republican votes that can get anything done. There is nothing in this chamber that can't be solved with both Republicans and Democrats coming together, working out the issues. We just did it recently this past summer on, I will say, is the most difficult issue that has been looming over the state capitol for decades, and that's education funding reform. But that was a classic example of where we can actually put politics aside and talk about the important issue. Everybody gets a little bit something. This was a great compromise moment. And I hope and I, I, I pray that we can use that as a model for moving forward, particularly with this budget year. There's a, there's a, there's a very tough lift, though, for lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. And that's uh, this idea of when it comes to uh, cutting back on the insurance premiums for state retirees, for uh, ratcheting back the amount of money that uh, uh, let's say state union workers uh, would expect in terms of an insurance offset. He's looking at $470 million there. That's good. You have Republicans downstate who work for state prisons, who work for state garages. That's going to be a tough vote for you folks. Well, we may not have to vote on it if AFSCME will work with the administration to solve and to resolve their contract. 
that's where most of this is emanating from is this lack so is, of is this the last best offer I think that that's what we're referring to but just mm -hmm. know that of the 30 some odd units bargaining units within state government uh, 99 percent of them have, have struck a deal with the administration AFSCME is one of the last remaining but it's the most expensive contract they they, it's, it's a large expense upon the state. I ask them to reach some conclusion on this impasse that they have between AFSCME and also the governor's office. But look, the legislature can find those savings. It's a subject for negotiation. That is if the Democrats want to find a balanced budget by the end of May. The, we, as, a governor, as I said earlier, the governor is the one who put together this, this, this blueprint. If they've got an alternative, that something is better and it balances, I'm wide open to meeting with them and finding a way to get it done. This isn't, this is a start, but it's a good start. It's a good start after a very difficult three years of this, this log jam that we've had regarding the state budget. The governor has continually said publicly um, that he wants to roll back the tax increase and talks about his vetoing of, or vetoing and then of course being overridden in that regard. But doesn't this spending plan use all of the money from that very tax increase, all of the revenue, rely on it? It is, but we also are, not all of it, that's the point of bringing back down the tax increases uh, incrementally, and he has that in his, uh, his, his request, his document that he uh, presented to us this morning. We're dealing with a, a very difficult situation. We could have supported or been, in, been on that budget last year which would have had the revenue included if they would have given us reforms. So uh, this is not something that, you know, we we anticipated that there would be probably more spending, but also there would be more revenue in addition to reforms. But we have to be realistic about what we're doing. We're not just going to say that we're going to, we're not going to get the votes to say that we're just going to repeal the tax increase in one full swoop. It's got to be done in a measured, uh, you know, scaled back year by year basis and the governor said I need a few years to do this so um, I'm going to take his lead on that I think it's important people were caught off guard of how quick it moved last summer and it was a dramatic increase in the income tax increase it was wrong I didn't support it but we can do better and we can start that process by scaling it back with a balanced budget and having a surplus of almost 400 million dollars. Leader Durkin thank you so much for your thank time you. on Illinois Lawmakers. Amanda Vinicky thank you so much. That's it for this special live edition of Illinois Lawmakers so long from Springfield.